All right, so I've started the recording. Welcome to Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin. We have a monthly meeting where we open it up to the public. Sometimes we have a speaker, sometimes it's just local Wisconsin residents speaking. Um, and tonight we have Dr. Sean Anthony Robinson, who is local to Wisconsin over in Oshkosh. And we're excited to have him here. He has quite, I actually, I looked up all the things that you had done, Sean, and I was like, wow, wow. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things here just so people have a background. Um, so um, Dr. Robinson is a PhD, full-time faculty member teaching reading. Um, he has over 40 publications, including his graphic novels series, Dr. Dyslexia Do, that he co-authored with his wife, and Shira, did I get her name right? <laughs> Good. Um, and his graphic novels inspire kids um, across the country. I do have a quick slide to actually show. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. So you can see his graphic novels down here. The third um, was recently added and I have the first two graphic novels of my kids love them and I had my students at the Dyslexia Center read them. Um, and so I have to get the third one yet, but it looks great. Um, something that wasn't mentioned in your bio, Dr. Robinson, is that you're an avid biker. So I think you should really add that to your, your um, line of interest. So an avid biker, he's biked numerous century rides as well as other rides to bring dyslexia awareness across the country. Um, and I'm not sure how many TED Talks have taken place in Wisconsin, but Dr. Robinson recently gave a TED Talk in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin on um, reading. And we can post the link to the TED Talk in the chat, <clears throat> as well as drdyslexiadu.com where you can purchase the graphic novels. Um, so I remember when I first met Dr. Robinson under some somewhat unusual circumstances and um, he humbly told me that I should just call him Sean. And um, as I recall, he passed me a little mini Snickers candy bar. So <laughs> you're always thinking about making um, other people feel at ease, I think. And this picture here of you biking, how long, how long had you biked that day? Was it 60 miles with a headwind or something? Um, I don't remember. That was 120 miles from Oshkosh to Middleton, but there were some headwind uh at one point but it was yeah it wasn't fun yes. yeah <laughs> so so there he is his kids were there to greet him and we had a small group of people in madison to say uh, great job on your your ride to bring dyslexia awareness so um so your your specialty or your focus has been adult learners and middle and high school students um i'm going to stop sharing screen here so okay um, so that's why I asked you to speak because a lot of us, particularly those of us in our um, dyslexia committee have students who are now in middle and high school and you hit some sort of a, I don't know if I wanna say desperation, but you hit some sort of a point where when your student is still struggling, a lot of our students have gone through a lot of um, tutoring already it's just kind of, it's frustrating and disheartening for parents. And I know that your work that you've done um, in the past with Special Olympics and other things um, has really played a role in how you work with your students. So <laughs> that was my main objective in asking you to join us tonight was those middle and high school students that are really struggling. Do you wanna talk more about um, your own experience in middle and high school or how you've used that to shape how you instruct students in that age group yeah whatever whatever you like you know thanks for having me on you know it's always a pleasure to be around um great minds right people who are fighting the same cause to you know uh, help students uh, particularly those who struggle with reading uh, ones who feel hopeless you know ones that really feel like they're are not going to make it. Um, you know, for me, my, my breakthrough came where I, I had um, learned to read by one of the, my my opinion, one of the greatest minds uh, in, in the field, but particularly here in the state of Wisconsin, um, uh, Dr. Robert T. Nash, uh, who 
was a genius and ahead of his time when it, when it came to uh, not just diagnosing students, but also delivering effective instruction for uh, adolescent and adult learners who had dyslexia. Um, Doc, Doc was a pioneer. Um, in fact, he, he uh, did some of his studies up in Rochester. He also um, <clears throat> presented a lot of uh, Orton Society conferences. And um, at that time, people were saying to him, like, you, you were ahead of your time in his delivery and his instruction. And um, Doc pretty much studied uh, the Webster Collegiate Dictionary uh, for uh, over 30 years of his life to develop a study guide in a sense for the dictionary that really helps students learn how to crack the code, not just spelling, but also reading to understanding syllable types uh, and just understand the consistency of our, of our language within the context of the dictionary. Um, I learned from him when I was a uh, graduated high school reading at the elementary level. And the very first word he gave me how to spell by sounds was monochromatism. I'm an 18 year old reading at an elementary level. And like, what am I supposed to do with my, 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 you know, monochromatism? Like, I had no idea how to use it, but his, his belief was if you can know how to effectively encode and decode a word, multisyllabic, you'll be able to see smaller one syllable words, you know, and, and be able to point them out, you know, mono, chrome, ism. And so um, he just really taught me how to appreciate language. He also taught me, you know, appreciate when um, we spell words by sounds, we assign different spellings to a given sound. He also taught me when we read words by, uh, by sounds, we assign different enunciation to the same letter or letter. So he really just taught me how to appreciate language and linguistics. And um, you know, I, I spent the next 25 years, you know, uh, until his, upon his uh, death, you know, studying underneath him. And then even after when he signed over his work to me and said, hey, it's really your turn to uh, continue my work. And so um, I just been really kind of off the radar in space by myself, you know, um, get it space, you know, um, just, you know, do, doing the work that needs to be done. Like, I'm, I'm not really trying to fit in with any crowds. I'm not really trying to look for people's approval, permission. Um, I'm just trying to do what God has placed in my heart to do, what Doc gave me to do. You know, he was a man that had a had a vision, right? Um, he started with five students when he was at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, five students. Now it serves over hundreds of students and it's, it's pretty much saved thousands of students' lives just because he had a vision. Um, and he, he had, or he has dyslexia himself present. No, he had it now, he passed away, but, um, he was just a genius and uh, all his work is empirically supported. And um, I don't know, he just gave me really uh, a, a true appreciation of, of language. I mean, the thing he told me is that if you can spell a word, you can read it, you can write it, but reading it doesn't guarantee that you can spell it. So that's the thing he always hit hard to me was we're gonna work on spelling. I'm not gonna focus on reading, I'm just gonna focus on spelling. and so. That's what I, I take with me in my instruction too when I work with adults or adolescents is I always focus on spelling because it's not really discussed, really. It's not really uh, covered much. And so, um, you know, it gives, gives students uh, access to that spelling. It builds their confidence when they, you know, attack words and it becomes more fluent, right? But we also know there's a lot of other, other um, things that go into reading, right? Strategies, SQ3R, comprehension. There's a whole variety of things that go into it, right? That, other students need to learn those strategies. But if you can't spell, I mean, you have a hard time even trying to attack the word and read it or pronounce it correctly. So um, my thing is I just work on spelling and I use doc system. Um, you know, I, I'll never talk bad about another system. You'll never hear me bashing a, a person, you know. Um, there's a system out there for everybody, right? There's a school out there for everybody. Um, for me, it was docs and um, it, it was just something that really gave me hope. I wish I would have had it when I was younger, right? Uh, particularly middle school, of course, elementary school, right? But uh, even in high school, I wish I would have had it. Um, I think would have built more confidence in me as a student. I wouldn't have felt, you know, uh, as lost or hopeless. Um, I don't know. I just think, you know, um, having a course that's designed around word analysis versus remediation. I think has a 
a stronger message to send to students than saying, hey, I'm gonna put you in this breakout class and remediate you. Nothing wrong with me, I don't need to be remediated. I need to learn how to read. I need to learn how to crack the code. Give me some higher level you know, uh, concepts and let me learn how to break those concepts down and build them up again. But I think you know, for myself, when um, I frame it that way versus remediation, I get more buy-in from students versus, oh, here we go again. We're do doing this remedial course. You know, I'm in this slow course with slow kids. Like that's the mentality, right? So um, that's why I think language has a lot of uh, uh, power to it, particularly the tongue, life and death. If you speak it and you speak, you know, your remediation and you speak these things, you're, you're going to feel these things about yourself. But if you say, hey, I'm in this high level word analysis course as a, you know, uh, high school student, it changes the game a little bit. It's more like an AP class, right? Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do even um, in the Madison School District. I'm working at a, at a, a school, working with uh, about 12 students online, three days a week, uh, helping uh, this one particular school try to change the narrative for this population of students that really you know, feel like they're just all out by themselves. And so um, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling. I'm say, coach. I'm a, I'm a pause to say, coach, take me out. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, well, going back to what you said though about giving them challenging words and you know looking more at it as a word analysis, that is an important thing um, to change the attitude of of what's what type of learning is happening, right? Because when you uh, hit the middle and high school years, these students really want to wrestle with something that's challenging. You know, they don't they don't want to have these CVC words thrown at them in repetition. They they would like to, um, you know, have you meet them at their intelligence level, right? Um, so do you find, that, like, how, can you explain how your students come in to your class, what, um, what type of um, feelings they have towards learning words, and then what changes do you see as you've given them instruction? Uh, most of the students that come in, you know, I think, they're all intelligent students. Like I, you know, they're they're, they're all capable of learning. Just I, I just tell them all that right off the bat. But they've had bad experiences in school, which has you know completely just shut them down, or they don't really have uh, you don't have trust issues, right? If you've been beat down for so long and, and in your environment, like you just don't have any trust. So my first thing is I always start with trust because if you don't have any trust, no matter what, any relationship, right? marriage, you know, dating, anything in life, you got to have trust. So that's like the first thing that we got to get out there is trust, make them feel that this environment is something that they can be, you know, vulnerable. And then uh, the next thing is that um, I just get right into it. I just jump right into it. You know, I, I, most of the students are about an elementary reading level, particularly the adults, maybe middle school. Um, all the words I give them are multisyllabic, they're all either scientific words, you know, or, or words from their career. And um, I just I just dive right into it. And then by the end of the semester, you know, they're they're on their way to, you know, doing this stuff independently. Uh, we use the Sarah assessment. I know you're familiar with that, too. Um, that was developed by jo John Sabatini from the University of Memphis. Um, I love it. You know, I'm sure there's some people that have, you know, uh, some different feelings about it but just to have that assessment on hand uh, and really understand where the students are at and then at the end of the semester seeing that they made these improvements in word identification right decoding these things were very uh, essential for these students like they made growth and that was the end of days i want them to make growth like i'm not looking for perfection right i want progress baby steps you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's not significant enough. You tell an adult learner or a high school kid that their growth is not significant, right? Like for them, that means everything to them. That means a whole world that they were able to, you know, move forward, even if it was a baby step, right? I don't care. But as long as they're moving forward and they feel confident about themselves and they can decode words, then I know I've I done my job correctly. But after 16 weeks, if they can't decode, then I have to look in the mirror and say, okay, Sean, what am, what am I doing wrong? And what can I do better to reach these students? And I think that's sometimes why people might be scared of assessments because it also shows us where, where, where we might be weak at, right? Or where we might struggle at. And for me, I liked it, right? Because one of the areas that I didn't focus on a lot was morthology. And I know that I have to really focus more on that 
you know, within the context of my classes, I tried to be strategic in how I did it. And it's really, you know, um, I need to do more of that type of instruction, but just to have access to it um, and see their growth. I mean, one, one adult learner, she, she said, Dr. Robinson, the best thing I took from this class after 16 weeks was reading street signs. I mean, to, for somebody that's power, right? But for some researchers, that doesn't really, that doesn't really cut it. Like they're like, no, that's significant enough. But for a human to be able to read street signs, uh, menus, newspapers, magazines, that's, that's power. That's liberation. That's allows somebody to feel like they are somebody versus just looking at a piece of paper and just staring at it for, you know, I don't know how many hours, days, weeks, months, years, they just stare at it and they, they try to get through the first sentence and they can't even get past the first word because they aren't unable to um, crack the code because they haven't been taught the skills to do it. So, um, I don't know. For me, I guess it's a very easy process because I've lived it before. And so um, I just tell students, you know, if you say I can't in my class, that's a nickel. If you say you can't do it, that's a nickel too. You know, because I, I try to I try to break that that mentality because again, you know, from you know a biblical standpoint, the, the tongue has life and death, right? If we speak death, well. You're gonna you're gonna draw that car, that energy to you. You're gonna you're gonna believe like you can't. You're gonna believe like you're less than, right? But if you speak things into existence, I can do it. I will do it. You know, then the energy is gonna come. But so the students, I think, have been broken down for so many years that they've spoken that or heard it. And so my thing is not just teaching the skills that I was taught, particularly around linguistics. It's just helping them feel good about themselves. Like, look, man, uh, you know, you're in a class. Look, I've been there before. It's not a good feeling, but we're just going to work through it and we're going to, you know, uh, move forward. And you can do it. You will do it. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I was, was, was it that I, I came, I saw, I conquered. Was that the phrase we, we did? Uh, the word we did? Yeah, okay. I was just going to I was just going to say that, like, um, when you talk about breaking the code and how you help these kids, I know recently when I was able to work with you, the one thing that I took from that experience was the fact that how you broke down a word that I would have no idea, even me have no idea how to break down that word and look at it in a dictionary and to be able to um, make those connections. So if you you know want, if you would like to do a quick presentation about how you did that for us, you know, pull out your little dictionary and um, show kind of just a quick showing for some of the parents that are here and how a child like ours would need that those lessons to be able to break that code. To repeat that again, please, a little bit. Make sure I heard you correctly. I was just saying, just would you like to do a quick part. Just a quick presentation on how you break down those words and how you break down that code that you're talking about with the, those words that are so, you know, multisyllabic. Yeah. I'm going to put it on uh, Katie's bill. I'm going to send her the bill. There you go. Yes. Big time, Katie. All yeah, right. I'm good for so, it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I use lar larger words, you know, for students and one of the things that Doc always taught me is really how to appreciate the dictionary, right? Um, I love the hard copy myself because one, hard copy, we think about, you know, metacognition, thinking about thinking, it allows us to think about the alphabet principle, letters, you know, spelling. We have to figure out, you know, what letter comes next when we think about words. The dic and then online, you can just type it in and if you get it wrong, it kind of gives it to you. Uh, but for me, I like the physical hard copy. Um, and so what Doc, what Doc always taught me was, um, you know, when we look at the word, uh, we always look at the left and the right side. Well, the left side teaches us orthographic mapping, spelling, right? That's how we spell the word, right? And then he says, okay, but no, we got to look at- We can only the... see part of your screen, though. I can only see part of your screen. Oh, I'm hang on. Sure I, see why. The, I, I see why. No, I see why. All right, let me, let me stop. Sorry. Okay. Uh, no. How about now? Yes. All right. So, so on the left here, Doc would always say, you know, that, that helps us to serve a purpose of spelling, right? How the words spell left to right. Then he says, okay, but we, we got to look at the sounds. We have to think about it as a puzzle. We have to think about how to match 
the phonies with the graphemes. Like we, we have to think about how they go and how they match. So when we see these, these little marks here, like we, we don't know what they mean. Like an average user does not gonna be like, okay, what's the A with two dots on it, right? So what Doc did was he literally studied the dictionary for 30 years to look at all these different uh, phonemic sounds and symbols and what they mean and what the interpretation of them they are. So interpretation of A with two dots is a short O, ah, right, ah. So we know that the first sound we hear in the word is ah, right? And so we would go through each letter at a time and then mm, and then p, And then we know that this is the schwa sound and the schwa sound is connected with the, with the E, uh. Right, and then we go on to the next one. And that's just the sound, mm, it speaks for itself. Then we have the A with two dots and the sound is ah, okay. Now we know that there's one sound left, but two letters, right? So the G makes the sound, right? So then we know that the last letter is silent. And the only way we know a letter is silent is, is we look here in the dictionary on the right-hand side to see that there's no sound for that letter E. Ampanage. So really it's just going through and coding it using Doc's study guide in the dictionary to allow students to understand how to match sounds with letters. Right, and sometimes we'll also find ourselves getting in trouble because the left side will not match with the right side. Some, some words don't match, right? In terms of syllable division. And for consistency, uh, you know, I always use the, the right-hand side, but sometimes, sometimes we may have to use the left. But really, it's really just teaching kids, adolescents, adults, how to use a dictionary. Dictionary is free, doesn't cost any money. You can go online to, to Amazon and buy a dictionary for $11. You just gotta know how to use it. And that's what Doc did. That's what his program was at UW Oshkosh, literally. He, he had students, um, he taught them how to use the dictionary based on the sound structure of our language. And uh, it was liberating. I mean, I don't know how many people's lives he, he saved uh, by teaching them how, how to crack the code by encoding. And then, you know, even take a, a step further, empennage, uh, it's a tail assembly of an aircraft, right? And then if you go down to Kay's favorite part, right? You think about the etymology of the word, right? History of the word too, where, where it originated from. But think about the year, 1908. What happened in 1908? Anybody know that that's significant with, with, with airplanes? Anybody have? I know some history majors in here. I know somebody's got to know. You can't Google it either. I saw Julie trying to Google it. No. Anybody have an idea? Emily. That... Oh, go ahead, Kimberly. No, I was like, uh, Emily Earhart, wasn't it? Maybe not. I don't know. The Wright brothers, airplanes. Uh, yeah. Right? Okay. So you think about the, the meaning of the word, too, right? Word analysis, analyzing the word. It's just not learning you know, um, how to spell it and how to pronounce it and understand the syllable divisions, but it's also understanding the definition and putting it into a context so the students can remember it, right? And so, um, you know, it really, that's what Doc did. He just, he said, hey, what's the first sound you hear in the word? Empanage, right? My turn, the first sound you hear in the word empanage is ah, right? Then he said, what's the second sound you hear? What's the third sound? What's the fourth? What's the fifth? what's the sixth, what's the seventh, and then so forth, right? So he would literally have us do this. And he'll be like, okay, how many letters in the word empanage? Now, how many sounds in the word empanage? Like, so he really had us analyze the word um, and just gave us appreciation of language, like just really appreciation of our sound structure, right? Um, Doc, Doc was a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know what, what the right word is here to say, but he has 103 sounds that he found that are, that are in the dictionary that are just based off our everyday language that, that we don't, you know, that we use. So for example, 
the schwa sound, everyone's favorite, right? Uh, well, Doc has 28 different ways to spell the sound uh, 28 different ways. Now, I'm not going to have a student memorize every 20 different ways, but the, the idea is that if they come across the word like why a uh, bear, why a uh, bear, uh, how many sounds do we hear to have a uh? why a uh, bear, uh, there's two uh sounds in there, right? So the first way to spell it is Y and A in, in that word. And the second one is A, Guayabera. So again, it's hearing the sounds and then making the connection between sounds and letters. And so Doc, Doc was just, I don't know, you know, I guess I'm kind of biased because he's the only one who taught me how to read and uh, he gave me life, uh, you know, when I, when I felt like I, I was pretty much dead. Uh, he just really... Um, Tell me how I use a dictionary and I became a nerd. Like I'm a nerd. Like I love to study. I love reading. I love um, uh, the dictionary. Uh, I think dictionary could be a, uh, a friend of a lot of students, particularly middle school and high school, if they are properly uh, trained how to use it. I think it could be a, a great value and asset for them um, to build their confidence and uh, build independency. Um, so, oh, Carrie, does that help answer your that, that question? I'm not sure if I'm kind of rambling no, here a little that bit. Was, that was perfect. I just wanted a quick example of you breaking down the sounds of how that works. So that was great. And I know oh, we've got a couple of questions. Katie has a couple of questions that we can answer just to keep this wonderful topic rolling. Well, we did have a question regarding Dr. Nash uh, about his project at, there was the question was, was his project at UW Oshkosh? Oh uh, yes, yep, yep. He was the, the founder of uh, uh, the Project Success Program, and uh, he was the creator of uh, his uh, curriculum, uh, Pure Complete Phonics. Um, and uh, yeah, he was on the mission. You know, he changed a lot of lives. And uh, before he passed away in 2017, he signed over his work to me and, and said. Uh, you know, it's your turn to continue my uh, my work. You know, so I think about all the all the people that came ahead of me that he could have gave the work to. You know, countless of students that were probably just as qualified or more qualified than me. And uh, in his mind, he, you know, he he had it set that he wanted me to uh, to continue his work. And so um, I just feel very honored and, and privileged to do it. You know, like I said, I'm, I kind of stay off the radar. I'm not really, you know, out there. You know. Um, showboat and stuff i'm just here to help help people you know and the same way doc helped me and um same way that uh, other other um uh, professors that were there helped me too um again i'm not looking for permission i'm not looking for approval i'm not looking to fit in with anybody i'm just doing what i've been i've been blessed to do and uh i know i'm good at uh and um you know i i, I love i love learning i love the dictionary uh, dictionary is one of one of my uh, my best friends. You know, one kid asked me, "What's my favorite book to read?" I said, "The Dictionary." You know, um, I find that fascinating because if I grabbed my book out at the dyslexia center, the kids would, you know, kind of cower in the corner and not want me to bring that out. But if you have the tools available to you to access all the information in the dictionary, you know, that is really freeing, and it can lead students to an independent. Uh, more independent reading. Um, what am I trying to say? You know, just a reading experience, yeah. just being independent. I feel like, you know, when your kids hit middle school and some of us have had the schools tell us that your students need to stop looking at remediation and, and start looking at life skills. And um, you can guess my response to that. You know, it, yeah, literacy, it, it, literacy is a life skill and you should be teaching them literacy. Um, but we did. We do have a couple of questions. I don't know if you mind um, thinking about them. One we have is how can we best enable a student to overcome a self-defeated attitude? I can't. It's hard. I won't try. I mean, I just tell them the truth. I'm not trying to hear it. I mean, it's just with me. You know, take that stuff somewhere else. Like I'm not. I'm not. I don't have time to to entertain that energy. You know, it's just. You know, for me, I think the fact that, I, you know, students that have street credit, right, not like street street credit, but just the experience of living this, I tell them, look, you know, when we come into this environment, learning online, you know, in person, 
leave that at the door. Like that's not, you're not going to bring this in this energy in because again, it serves no purpose, right? For them or for me, right? Because I think of myself as a student and then on the other side now, like a student says that it kind of shuts everything down, right? It just kind of, you know, everyone's shut down, like students shut down. I'm in my emotions as an adult, right? I'm getting, you know, up, uptight about it. But then, so everyone's out of the game from the beginning. But if we, I say we, myself, change and say, look, okay, you know what? I'm not going to uh, listen to that self-defeating attitude, right? When you come in here, we're going to flip the script, right? We're going to talk about what, what you can do. And I think for me, the moment when then they, they see that is when I teach them how to decode a word, right? I give them, intentionally, I give them a multi-syllabic word that's way above their grade level, age level. Like I don't give them house and mouse and boat and cold. Like, no, that's an insult to intelligence. I'm not giving a middle school kid, a high school kid that word. Like you want to shut them down, give them that word, right? Like go ahead and give them that word. But if you want them to feel good about themselves and change that, that self-defeating attitude, give them more like monochromatism, right? Give them a word that's multi-syllabic and teach them how to encode and how to decode and how to use the dictionary effectively and efficiently, then you're going to, it's going to change. It's just, just gonna, it's just going to change like that. You know, um, they're going to, they're going to start believing themselves. And then the whole self-defeating attitude is going to change. But I mean, can you blame a student? Like you come into the classroom and she's like, okay, now we're going to spell bolt. Then we're going to drop the B and we're going to put a C. What does that say now? Like, no, like that's, that, that has, serves no purpose. Like that's, that doesn't engage students. Like give them a medical word, right? Give them a Latin word. You know, Kay loves Latin, right? Give them a word that's multi-syllabic, right? That's challenging to them and let them tackle that word. And then watch everything else kind of unfold. But I mean, if, if you want to just let them be self-defeated, yeah. Keep giving them, you know, rat and mat and bat and sat and cat, like. Because you can teach those skills within the larger words. So you don't have to confine them to those words that they already know the meaning of, right? You're going to expand their knowledge of um, different um, subjects, like medical terms or whatever they're going into. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, the test, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I completely agree with everything you said. And uh, I have a, a, a seventh grader who's going through that same thing. They're currently still teaching cat and rat and bat. And he thinks himself stupid on a daily basis. And I think that what you're saying is 100% truthful. And it definitely comes to the point where I think these kids, it's not really to me, I don't look at it as an ad, a self-defeating attitude. I look at it as a coping mechanism for them. You know, all these years, it's just I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. It's like they're, it's the shutdown coping mechanism where they feel like they, they, everyone around them has given up on them. So I, I, I applaud you for saying that because I completely agree. Yeah, it's purpose. I mean, I don't care. It's recorded, not recorded. I don't care. Some tells me, tells me it was, a, it was the worst answer I ever gave. I don't really care. It serves no purpose of giving a middle school kid or high school kid cat rat sat bat it serves no purpose it's an insult to intelligence right they are creative intelligent humans so why not allow them to use their creativity and their bandwidth and their mind the way it's supposed to be used like like they're sitting in the back of a classroom like that does not that doesn't help it serves no purpose Give them these one syllable words, it serves no purpose. Right? This is just an insult to their intelligence. It has no motivation for them, right? And so for me, again, I'm very intentional. I, I tell you off the bat, look, I'm gonna push you. I'm giving you large words and you're gonna work. And I I, I have no failure. Like I, I have no problem with the students, you know. Um, you know, I've I've been doing this for the I don't know, since I was 18, and so uh, I've been working with students since I was an undergrad, my master's, my PhD. Thereafter, I've done prisons, I've done boys and girls clubs, I've done churches. I've uh, I've been, you know, I I ran a a, a summer uh, literacy camp at the boys and girls club in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. 
Um, I ran a, a literacy uh, 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 class at, a, at, a, at two different churches, one in Appleton and one in Nina uh, for 10 weeks in the summer. And the pastors were just blown away. They were just completely blown away. I started with a, uh, a youth class. It's about seven, seven students in it. I had one middle school kid. And then probably uh, two, three weeks into the, into the uh, summer session, uh, the pastor came to me and said, hey, uh, Doc, uh, the parents want one now. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the, the parents want one now. They see the, their sons and daughters making change. And some of these parents struggle with reading, too, and they want to take your class. So he said, would you mind adding another class? I said, no, it's fine. So I had two classes, but then it actually turned to one because the parents and the kids were working together. Like, it just became a, a learning environment where they all worked together, and the kids were teaching the uh, – the adults and the adults were teaching the other adults. So it just became a learning environment. And um, it was all, again, multi syllabic words. And um, one of the things uh, that Doc always emphasized to us was um, teaching, all right? So I was 18, started the, su the summer program. After a few, a few weeks, he was like, okay, Sean, it's your turn to get up on the board and teach your peers. I'm like, what, me teach? He's like, yeah, that's, that, was, that was a part of the system, build confidence. So he would have us, he would give us a word, have us decode it, and get up there and actually literally teach from his format and his script. And, uh, you know, he respected that people were nervous, but at the same time, he was like, you got to get over that. You're, you're amongst your peers who struggle with reading too, and you're going to have to do public speaking eventually. Like, you're going to have to get out there. You're going to have to speak. You're going to have to do, you know, communication class. You're going to do something where you have to speak in front of people. And so he felt like the best way to practice was among, you know, your, your peers, particularly within this context of, of, of teaching, spelling and reading. And so um, it just became a natural process to me. Like, um, I don't know, kind of rambling there a little bit. So I'll be quiet. Say, coach, take me out. Well, I mean, that kind of feeds into a question we had. of How does this lend to increased confidence and independence with students and I think when you're teaching in small groups and you are building the confidence within the group and then you're letting students take the lead, you're building even more confidence. Um, do you have anything else to say about um, the dynamics of your class? Um, you know, small groups? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I just, I just try to meet the students where they're at, but I also, try, I also push them to, you know, not to the point where they're going to break, you know, but, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I just make it engaging, right? Because I've lived it before. So, you know, I'm giving them things that I wish I would have had um, when I was at that age. I think would have helped me. Uh, but, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, life happens. You know, you can't sit around and cry about it. It's life. You got to keep moving. And so uh, for me, I think it's the fact that uh, uh, I make the things relatable, right? I, I, can, I can connect with them. And I just, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's just uh, just a place uh, where they can feel like they can be vulnerable. Like that place where they can say, you know what? Uh, it's okay to say, I don't know. Like I tell students, look, I don't know everything. I'm not going to pretend like I do. Like there's some people who think they know everything, right? Particularly people with PhDs that they know everything. You can't tell them anything, right? I tell students, look, there's a lot of things I don't know. And if I don't know it, I'll find the answer for you and get back to you, period. Like that's just, that's just how it is. And so, um, you know, just teaching them, I think, how to use a dictionary. I think that's it. It's just the key. Once you teach them how to use a dictionary and, and use it effectively, then um, that just kind of takes off and it kind of become independent and confident. And then they become empowered. Like, they don't have to rely on the tutor anymore, right? All they need to do is just rely on the dictionary. That's it. Like, they just open up a dictionary and boom, there they go. And they work with uh, Doc's uh, workbook. I'm not sure if it's workbook. All right. And then that's it. Then they can just do it on their own. I think somebody had a question about writing. So in, in Doc's, uh, 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 on his uh, worksheet, he has a writing exercise that says this word as a term, uh, as a term is used as a noun, verb, adjective, right? Um, and then a sentence that uses this word is, so and then we talk about the word and it helps students actually use the word in context, right? They have to think about how, to use the word um, in, the, in a proper sentence. And so sometimes that can be kind of hard, right? Being on the spot, right? So I tell students, hey, go home, 
talk it over with your mom and dad or your grandparent or your big brother, big sister, have a conversation and bring it back to the next class. Because putting them on the spot like that, we know can increase a lot of anxiety, particularly students that may have some writing struggles. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you, you got to do it right now. Like, dang it, do it now. You know, no, no, go home, take, take 24 hours for that, whatever you need. Think about how to use it. Talk with your parents, write it, and then come back and deliver it. But, uh, you know, I think that's just, you know, builds confidence is having students use the word in the, in the right sentence, you know, either writing it or orally too. And it just, it just builds appreciation of language too, not just writing it, but uh, speaking too. I don't know if that made sense or not. Well, it doesn't. If you're doing bigger multi-syllable words, you're adding um, knowledge and content to what they already know. So that, that also goes along with that question about writing, because if they have a wider knowledge of language, that's going to carry over into their writing, too. Yeah, it just, again, when we think about analysis, right? I think even Doc, in our last training with, uh, you know, we have with teachers and parents, with Dr. Mack talked about analysis, right? It just really, you know, we think it's about Bloom's taxonomy, right? That's where I'm trying to get the students to the very top. Like I want them to analyze the word, not just understand from the decoding, encoding principles, but I want them to understand how to pronounce it. I want them to understand, you know, there, there might be digraphs, trigraphs in it too. I want them to understand the epistemology of the, where the word originated from. So it's expands everything and sometimes in 50 minutes we might just do one word one word right we might just do one word to talk about all these things in that one session and you could do a lot in one session uh you know with a multi syllabic word you know you have a lot of great conversations about the word and um uh, you know just again it builds vocabulary it gives gives you know kids hope you know give kids you know again just appreciation of, of language and all starts with the dictionary. It's free. It doesn't cost. I mean, it's not like a, a you know, a, a program you have to go buy, you know, pay $1,000, what, 12 bucks on Amazon? Deliver the next day if you have Prime, right? Like, you get it the same day? Like, it's really, I mean, I love it. Like, well, I'm, and then the I'm, online app, you know, my daughter had a, a lot of print anxiety for a while and so just looking at a big book would have been difficult um but she has her phone with her you know and she gets the phone out and she's looking left to right she's looking at the syllable division she's looking at the sounds so she's not intimidated um but you know i haven't given her the full dictionary yet she knows it's there she knows it's there she did alphabetize her latin dictionary so that's good see that's that's it. That's just again the independence, right, and power mm -hmm. and the confidence. That's 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 really uh, it. Really, it is. You know, um, I'm kind of biased. I, I love the, the 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 hard copy print because again, when somebody says, "Hey, I want you to spell," you know, um, or think about the the word uh, echelon, right? Like you have to think in your head. Uh, uh, like you have to literally think and have to open up the dictionary and look through to figure out the spelling patterns and where it's at. Online, you can type it. If you have a, a typo, it gives you the word, right? But by, by opening up a hard physical copy in your hand, to me, that's liberation because you can go through and think about how to spell the word echelon you know, you can go through it and try to figure out backwards, frontwards, try to figure it out, you know, with your hand, fingers. Down. So I'm, I, I love the dictionary. I, I have seven of them here at my office right here at my home. I have, I have my original one from when I was in college, just tore up. Because of your so, word sleuth. I guess, yeah. I, I love it. It's just, you know, um, I mean, you think about it, the dictionary was here before I was born. It's going to be here after I die. All right. So why not know how to utilize it, right? And you really the true understanding of the linguistic knowledge you get from it, right? You just we don't just get phonemes, graphemes, morphology, right? Semantics. And so we understand everything, definitions. We understand the multiple definitions. We understand, you know, the origin, the year. And so uh, 
and so um yeah i'm i love the dictionary i'm gonna get a shirt that says i love the dictionary i love the dictionary you should you should get a shirt yes. that dictionary I, I might get jumped by students if i wear it you know am i not think i'm cool <laughs> I like the thesaurus too. So yeah, yeah. See, I, see, answer, see, all that stuff is right there at your fingertip, right? It, regardless if it's online, the hard copy, it's all right in front of us, and it doesn't cost much at all to open up a dictionary and look at. It. You just have to know how to use it. That's it. Well, the Won't other you know interesting to... thing is that you're taking one or two words and you're delving deep, right? Because with things you can you can take something and you can dive really deep or you can look at a wide variety of things and a lot of our students with dyslexia also have working memory issues or you know slower processing speed um, do you find that your pace is maybe um, easier for some students that have dyslexia or just struggle reading in general than you know having them read a, a larger volume of words with the same kind of sounds in them can you, can you repeat that again, please? I'll make sure I, I heard you correctly. So sometimes when we're working with students, different people might give a large smattering of words. Do you find that diving deep into a few words offers the students that may have executive functioning issues more time um, to wrestle with the sounds and oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. come to their own realization? Yeah, it's like an aha moment, right? Like it, it allows them to really appreciate our language. Like if they're students, well, I know myself, I have anxiety. I'm sure people have it. Why would I want to give a student five words in 50 minutes? That serves no purpose besides build their anxiety, make them feel like they're less than still, and it serves no purpose for them or for me. So why not capitalize and maximize on their, their potential? Say, okay, what? We're going to talk about this word and we're going to dive into it. What's the first sound, second sound, third sound, fourth sound? What's the last sound you hear? What letter is silent? How we know letter is silent? Only way we know, we can't make assumptions. We just can't. We have to look in the dictionary on the right hand side to see what letter or sounds missing. And so then we talk about the you know etymology. So it's really just having that conversation, right? If we think about this, people say, well, Teachers need training too, right? That's that's what we talk about, right? Teachers need training, right? When they say students, well, they need remediation. No, students need the same type of training that teachers do. They need to have instruction training that really helps them analyze words, right? So if we're saying that kids need remediation, well, then teachers need remedi to be remediated too, right? Because, I mean... Well, some I think that's a, a really good point. I think that's a really good point. And it, it changes the frame too, right? Because when schools say, well, when are we going to move from remediation to life skills? When, you know, why aren't we moving towards instruction and practice? You know, why, why aren't those the things we're considering? Yeah, well, so you think about this too, like, again, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm, I don't know everything. I'm more speaking from my own lived experience. But when we think about word analysis, right? And we think about having these conversations and really understand phonemes, graphemes, and the whole, um, just the whole word itself. Well, you're not just tackling phonics and phonological awareness, but you're also taking it from a whole language perspective too, right? You're building vocabulary. You're having conversations about the word. You're giving students access to both, right? You're teaching them how to spell the word but then you're teaching them how to use the word in context and be able to store that word in their working memory, short-term and long-term, which then have appreciation of language. So would that kind of be both? But just me, I mean, you know, like uh, it's a little bit of both because you're exposing them to really both methodologies through analysis and analyzing words, the word structure, right? And prefix and suffixes and root words, right? And then also understanding how to attack the word and how to spell it by sound. So it's a little bit of both to me. So I don't know, but again, what do I know? Well, I mean, and like my daughter said, it makes sense. So, you know, it's, it's someone who struggled to read, put this in a, a way that's easier 
you know, possibly for more kids that have struggled to read to understand in this manner, which I think is important. Because I know yes. I definitely think different. Um, and, I, you know, reading was not as much of a struggle for me, so. Yeah, even 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 in the words at the the, the college, but also with with students, you know, I, I do focus. There's a question here. I do focus on math, science, and medical words. I I focus on all that. Like I just pull them out. Um, I actually get words, some words from my wife's a doctor, so I pull up words that that I don't know how to pronounce that I have to do myself before I even teach it because I'm like, look, I'm not gonna expect them to try to pronounce it if I can't pronounce it or if I can't spell it. So. I have to figure out, you know, look it over first a couple of times myself to make sure I do it correctly before I expect the student to do it, right? Because that would be fair. Hey, spell this medical word. What's it mean? Well, I don't know. How you pronounce it? Well, I don't know. Like, that's, that's, that's there's no purpose. So I, I have to literally go look it up myself, encode it, decode it myself. And uh, yeah, you know, over the summer, I think... Uh, I did uh, one weekend, 300 words total that were a, com a combination of uh, medical or well, scientific terms. Uh, my wife was like, get a life. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you sitting down in the office doing it? Like, I literally spent all weekend from like Friday all the way to Sunday just doing words. Do -do 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 -do. I was just on a, on a like, I was focused. Well, now you're set. You don't have to stress out about finding words for your lesson plans because you worked ahead. Yes, yes, well, too much, too much. And even even my, my former uh, professor, Dr. Uh, uh, Kitts, who was another colleague of Dr. Uh, Nash, he, he one day looked at me, he said, man, you're turning into a Dr. Nash. He said, he said, bless your, your soul and your heart, man. He's like, put the dictionary down. Don't email me at three in the morning. Stop emailing me at two in the morning. Like, I was like, doc, I found this pattern. I found this. And he's like, stop, stop. He's like, just stop before you get ahead of yourself. He's like, you're becoming a little Dr. Nash. And I'm like, ah, you know, like, so, yeah. I made, I've made videos too. I have like, um, I think 50 videos I made on medical terminology that I made too. So on how to, how to, uh, how to uh, properly spell it and pronounce it. So, yeah, you know, um, I'm a nerd. What can I say? Have you had any of your um, your students say that they've really become interested in words and linguistics after oh. uh, taking your course? Yes, to, to the college. Yes, all the students um, were like, "I love this. I love the dictionary. I never thought I loved the dictionary before." So, um, you know, uh, I just become addicts. You know, it's, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a drug. You know, I need to go go like to uh, you know word anonymous or something like that because uh it's just i don't know I, I love it it's just it's just a great great time you know it's just to, to have think about this you're you're somebody who has struggled you know much of your younger younger life you know up to middle school high school and even to adult and you felt like you just never were able to to crack the code and you're, a, you're, you're, you're able to crack it it's 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 a rush you know you become driven you just i don't know something about it you know i see it with students they just become you know addicted to it they they just appreciate um having access to knowledge and knowledge is right here at their fingertips it's really just open up the dish you haven't got color coded see you know so what can i say we did have a, a couple of questions about um, students that have other struggles, um, other behavioral issues, as well as um, dyslexia and some other comorbidities. Um, what do you say to those parents who are still trying to get help for their um, students? Yeah, you just you got to keep pushing, you know, you just, there's something out there for everybody, right? There's something out there for somebody, um, you know, there's programs out there, you just got to do your homework, you know? Um, before you invest in something, you got to make sure it's worth, uh, you know, not just your time as a parent, but more importantly, for your son and daughter, right? You want to make sure that whatever investment that you're going to do, that there's a return, right? You're not just going three, four or five years and your son and daughter keeps hitting the head against the wall and not making any progress. And you're like, wait, I paid thousands of dollars 
And my son Dara is supposed to be, you know, moving forward and they're just at the same or maybe worse than they started. So I think it's just really um, asking questions, you know, not like in a, an approach where, you know, you're calling somebody out. But I mean, you know, you, you just you just got to ask questions. You got You got to ask. I think that the biggest thing is, is the. Um, uh, it's a trust. Right. I'm not trusting anybody and everyone with my kids. I just the bottom line, right? I want to make sure that whoever uh, I put my, uh, yeah, show me the data. There we go. Uh, I want to see too that not just the data, but I want to make sure that there's a, a connection, right? I want to make sure that this adult has respect for my son or daughter where they're at without having passing any judgment, right? I want to make sure that they really value who they are when they walk into, you know, the, tutoring center or if it's an online platform, you know, I, I want to make sure that this is the right fit. Um, I always tell, tell parents, I might not be the right fit. You know, I might be a little bit too uh, uh, aggressive. I'm not the right word, but you know, I, I'm passionate. I'm passionate about what I do. And so, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's all about finding the right fit. It really, it is. It's like a puzzle. You got to figure it out. Sometimes it takes patience and uh, we all don't, all have patience, right? We all want it now, 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 now. We want it yesterday. We want it, you know, three days ago, right? And so I think it's just really about about being patient. That's one thing I, I learned working with students in my own experience is that, you know, I just got to be patient with the kids, like, you know, and, you know, every time I work with groups, I always learn something, right? I learned something from, um, you know, uh, Sophie, Right. I've learned something for my college students. Like I always learn something that helps me become a better instructor and a better teacher because I get to watch them. I get to see where they're at. And if I notice that they might not have caught on to something, I have to ask myself, what am I doing wrong? What can I do better to make sure that the next person or this person gets it? Right. So it's just be observant, you know, understanding my, my, uh, my audience. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Look, I'm not perfect by any, any, any means, I, 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 you know, my thing is that um, I've been blessed with this, this, uh, I, to me, it's ministry work, I guess, sense, right? Saving souls, giving kids hope. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I can do it, if I die tomorrow, I live the good life. You know, I, I've been, I've been blessed, you know? And so uh, my thing is that the work I do, uh, I try to make it uh, affordable and accessible for families. People are like, oh, doc, man, you should, you should be charging, you know, thousands of thousands of dollars with your credentials I'm like no that's that's not how i was raised and that's not ethical to me and so um i know how hard my mom had to work to try to get multiple tutors right that didn't really pan off they just took her money and took off right so um i'm just trying to be of, of service uh and that's i guess that's it out in space Maybe I'd be like a Richard Richard Branson and go to space, you know, not a dyslexic to space. Doo -doo. <laughs> well, I think parents really appreciate that because we, you're, you know, we've been through what your mom went through, spending, you know, thousands of dollars on different programs. And um, I always kind of encourage parents not to go into the trap that I initially fell into was we have one tutor in town and that's the person you go to. And that was not a good fit for us. So, um as a as much of a bummer that the pandemic has been i think that the online um resources have gotten better and your small group online classes are an, an example of what we can do and how we can reach kids and and um it's just it's nice to hear your perspective on things but well, we need to thanks. honor your time too i think we're at 902 and i know you've got kiddos and and your wife so <laughs> Do you have any other final thoughts or? No, I mean, it's up, really up to you if you have any, you know, final questions or, you know, I have about five, 10 more minutes I could probably give. So, yeah. I mean, I would just like to reiterate because we're still, I mean, we're getting a couple of questions in the, in the chat about how to instill confidence and independence. And I think you had said that you instill confidence and independence by, you know, giving them something to struggle with that's kind of challenging, but not. Uh, to the point where they feel defeated so they can they can struggle and grow and then also in a small group environment I feel like that is kind of critical for this age because do you feel like the students learn more off of each other in the small group environment 
Oh yeah, most definitely. You know, it's uh, you know, it, it's just uh, having that uh, ability to communicate with each other, right? And uh, you know, it's a safe place, right? You know, uh, Doc was never a believer of really one-on-one -on -one instruction. He always felt like instruction should be small or large groups. So I've like I've I've done three, five, I've done fifteen at the most. And so um, I always found that that group dynamic was uh, at times healthier than one-on-one -on -one because students got to really develop a, a cohort, right, and of learners and build off each other, their strengths and the weaknesses, right? And so uh, I always felt like uh, that, that type of environment was uh, a little more healthier for, for students, right, uh, particularly those that struggled at reading, right? That they felt it was a safe place, right? They didn't feel like they had to be worried about somebody bullying them or somebody saying, oh, you're dumb, you're slow, you can't make it, or, you know, giving them a hard time. But being in an environment where it was okay to not get an answer right, where they weren't feeling like they had anxiety. Like I told them, hey, you got it wrong? Okay, big deal. Just keep it moving. Let's go back. Let's figure it out. And let's talk about it versus just moving on. And then they don't really understand why they may got it wrong. So um, it's just, I think that the group dynamic that dynamics helps a lot. So too. Carrie, did you have any other questions before? I think there was one question up above. I'm having a hard time finding it now in the chat, but it was something about um, high school. What do you have any recommendations for um, help with high school kids? when they're in school like does your um kids that you tutor do they say something or other works better for them while they're in school um well right now i'm i'm contracting through the mass and the part of school district and um, i'm working with a group of students in a uh, specific class so um i work with them while they're in that class a couple of days a week and so um my biggest thing, I always think as the students are in the school time, they should get this instruction. They shouldn't have to wait to after school, you know, and burnt out. They got sports, you know, and then they, they come home. They got to, you know, study and then top of that, do tutoring. This stuff should all be during the day, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to whatever time they get out, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. I would I would have to say I completely agree with that. My son came home today. He had a rough day and he came home from the bus crying and he was like, Mom, my head is pounding. Like I I don't don't talk to me, don't ask me any questions. And he went right into his room and started crying because he's like, My head hurts so bad. And like people don't really understand that, that their brains are working 20 times harder than our you know, neurotypical brain. And it it is exhausting to them. I mean, it's the one thing we did was take out homework. No homework. They don't have any homework come home because what they're doing in, in school is enough for them to. So I think that focus time during school is is very important. And then be able to have that freedom to just decompress when they get yeah. home. Yeah, it's like, hey, you're coming home from school. I don't care if your head hurts. You know, we're going to go to tutoring now. It's yeah. like your head hurt more. You know, it's like, no, like that doesn't do any justice for anybody, right? It, it just, they, they check out they're mentally gone like they're just whoop you know like chef should be in school during the day you know uh, not pull out like it should be in their class they should have this type of instruction in their their language arts classes like it, it it just it's simple like you give them the tools in class they can apply it in their classes they can apply it throughout their day then they feel confident they feel independent right but if you give it to after school they're checked out they want to do sports play play video games xbox you know whatever they want to do be kids they want to go out and play in the park the last thing they want to do is is learn about you know the schwa and and you know um prefixes and suffixes and root words and graphemes and phonemes and you know our controlled syllables like no they just want to be kids they want to go out and have fun like so I don't know. I won't be quiet now. I'm going on and on and on. I mean, as a group, I told Dakota dyslexia, and you know, as a, a parents that we're just trying to navigate this system one day at a time, we truly appreciate your time coming here no and um, helping us, you know, give a little insight on 
on how we can help our children. And like you said, gather that data and gather that information and how we can support them and um, advocate for them within the school district. And we just truly appreciate you taking the time to help us out. Oh, you're welcome. You know, one, one, one thing I think too would help uh, just in general is I, I love the book, Speech to Print. I love it. I think it's a fantastic book. There's so much knowledge in there. I think that if, if parents collectively came together and understood that content and went to the to the, more of the boards, I think I think change could occur because that's what people are missing. Even the teachers don't even know that stuff. Like they, they don't know anything. So you know, um, I think the more parents can be, you know, uh, armed with that knowledge, I think it would really propel them forward in their, their missions, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I went into my current IEP meeting and I was saying things that like the, the principal and everyone was like, wait, how do you know that? How, how do you know that information? I'm like, because I actually looked it up and I gathered information. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, I agree. It, it, cha it, changes, it changes the game. It changes the narrative completely. The ball is in, in your court yep. versus their court now. So Well, we appreciate your time tonight. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been great. Welcome. Yes, and thank, thank you for, you for all the all the participants that are here and listening in. Um, it was a great turnout, and we were really happy that this could um, help tonight. So we usually have an open meeting on Thursdays. You can check us out on our website, Decoding Dyslexia. Is it WI, Andrea, or Wisconsin? If you search Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin, it'll come up. Um, and you can subscribe to our newsletter and we have a calendar of events on there too. So I'm gonna stop the recording.